Howdy ladies and gentlemen, this is Lars Schall talking to you. I am an independent financial journalist and I have been in London recently on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management to meet up with some very brilliant minds in the world of finance. In this part that you are watching now, I had a conversation with Alistair McLeod, the research director of Gold Money. Alistair McLeod started his career as a stockbroker in the 1970s on the London Stock Exchange. Within nine years, McLeod had risen to become a senior partner at his firm. He subsequently held positions at director level in investment management, fund management and banking. For most of his 40 years in the finance industry, McLeod has been demystifying macroeconomic events for his investing clients. Alistair, there were two reasons why I wanted to interview you in front of the Bank of England. However, we were not permitted to shoot the interview there. We are still here now in the city of London, but where are we exactly? Well, we're in a little street called Austin Friars, in front of the Dutch Reformed Church, which has been here for a very long time and has done a lot of very good charitable work in the city. Austin Friars is a nice little street. It's a back street, not very far away from the Bank of England. And in the old days, it was all stockbrokers. Um, now it will be asset management companies and you know, hedge funds and that sort of thing. But a very, very nice quiet street, hopefully, or, or a lot quieter than in front of the Bank of England. Yes, it is. Alistair, one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you in front of the Bank of England is one of the new blockbusters in central banking, and this is called Forward Guidance. What is this and why are they doing it? Well, forward guidance is interesting because uh, in the old days um, they would try and produce an announcement which wouldn't surprise the markets too much. So it's an extension of that. What they're saying to the markets is that um, over the next year or so we expect the following to happen and usually they will say that about interest rates. And the idea is that it brings a degree of stability into the market and it means the relationships between, let's say, short-term bonds and long-term bonds doesn't alter materially. And that stability is seen as a good thing. It's really what the, what the central bank wants to achieve. Can they stick to it? Time will tell. Um, I think probably not because uh, at some stage I think uh, price inflation will start moving up probably this winter, I think it might start moving quite sharply and at that stage they will have a problem because if the economy itself is not really moving, not improving much, uh, yet inflation is beginning to increase, then they're going to, they will find that they will be forced into raising interest rates in, contra in contravention of the forward guidance that they will have already given. So we have to watch, we'll, we'll wait and see how it pans out, but I suspect it's not going to be as easy as people think. The other reason why I wanted to interview you in front of the Bank of England are the changes that are coming related to the LBMA and the Bank of England is its ringmaster. Can you tell us about those changes? Yes, um, I think the, the, the state of the uh, London bullion market and where it fits into the whole of the regulatory uh, system goes back to Big Bang which was in the mid-1980s and at that at that time it was determined that bullion and metals would not be, um, uh, if you like, uh, a regulated investment, unlike stocks and shares and derivatives. Uh, and this meant that uh, the market uh, in bullion could sort of more or less look after its own devices and it remained an over-the-counter market, a telephone market between bullion banks, with a reference fix in the morning and a reference fix in the afternoon. The whole thing has been blown open because Deutsche Bank um, has relinquished their silver seat, the silver fixing seat, and at the, at the same time they've tried to, to market or to sell their gold fixing seat, but there were no buyers. And that clearly indicates that the lawyers, the in-house legal advice in other bullion banks basically was, don't get involved in this. It may be a money maker, but don't get involved with it because the regulatory scene has changed. So um, the whole environment has altered. And the other thing which has changed very much, which London hasn't kept up with, is new markets, particularly the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which now clears an enormous amount of gold. Um, it delivers over 2,000 tons into the local market. You've got other markets like Dubai, who see themselves as being in the middle of um, 
uh, large holdings of gold uh, in Arab hands and also on the road to, to India. You've now got Singapore as well. So there is competition. There are new markets who have far higher standards of information for people who want to use those markets than London has. So London, in effect, is old-fashioned. It, um, it doesn't give enough information out and it'll get bypassed if it remains as it is. So you would say one challenge for London is uh, the topic of transparency? I think that's, uh, that's a, probably the most important uh, topic as far as London is concerned. I mean, people in the bullion market don't think that transparency is that important. They see, they see it operating well as far as they're concerned. But I think increasingly in this day and age we need to have that transparency because otherwise, um, you know, with the internet and everything else, you get conspiracy theorists and before you know where you are, um, suddenly it's lack of information that's the problem rather than too much information and I think that's, that's, that's where we are. So you think conspiracy theories um, are caused by a lack of transparency? I have no doubt about it because then they can either be dismissed or, 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 or proven. Um, but if you... If, if you just don't have the right information in the market, then essentially you are distorting the market. And, um, you know, we had this situation, Barclays Bank were fined, for example, um, for, uh, um, uh, if you like, putting their, their, their position ahead of their client's position on a fix. And um, they were fined and the dealer was uh, banned from working for the, in the city. Now, that the suspicion that that goes on all the time is in the back of everybody's mind. So uh, that is why the system has got to change. And not only that, but if you bear in mind that IOSCO, which is the sort of international body that uh, sets the standards for, for clarity uh, and how, how uh, fixes should operate, um, they have 19 tests for a fix. And the London bullion uh, market comes up, it satisfies probably only four of them. So obviously it, isn't, it really is not good enough. And I think that the, the change that London's going to see has got to be really very, very fundamental. One discussion we have in the West is, is gold money? Now, central banks hold money in their, reserve, in their reserves. Uh, and also private banks are trading gold on the currency desk. So it's pretty obvious that it is money. Why is gold money? Well, I can answer it another way. Um, uh, over the last 20 years, Asia has developed enormously. And you have three and a half billion people, maybe four billion if you include Southeast Asia. And they regard uh, gold as money. It's actually as simple as that. So whatever we think, I mean, if we buy the Keynesian line that, um, oh, it's, you know, it's the barbaric metal or the barbaric standard, or whatever, if we buy that line, it's actually, that's not the point. The point is that the new emerging world, with considerably more people than us, accept that gold is money. And furthermore, the Chinese are actively promoting it as an investment medium amongst their own people. And do you think the Chinese, the Chinese state, is buying gold to uh, prop up the, the strengths of the yuan? Without a doubt. Um, I, what the rationale is, whether it's, it's to do with their own currency or not, um, I think is an open question. But uh, you never ever see one kilo bars um, minted by Chinese state-owned refiners in the market. And that clearly tells me that the government takes all its own production. And not only does it take all its own production, but it also refines gold from Mongolia and various other um, uh, countries in Asia. As well as that, it's got contracts all around Africa to take Dore and to mine it, even, if, even where they don't own the mines. And it is trying to do the same with Australia. So you can see that progressively, greater and greater amounts of gold bullion are actually bypassing the London market. Yeah. So, and that's what we've got to deal with. Um, will the Shanghai Corporation Organization be the player in the gold market in the future? Well, it's interesting because I think all the members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization are buyers of gold, or at least their central banks are. As well as that, the associates uh, um, uh, who intend to join in future tend to be buyers of gold. I mean, Turkey, for example, um, they have indicated a, a desire to join uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization now that their ambitions to join the European Union have fallen by the wayside. And guess what? They're buyers of gold. Uh, the, the, the Turkish people use gold all the time. I mean, they would prefer gold in transactions for many, many things. 
which is hardly surprising when you bear in mind that the Turkish lira, they lopped six noughts off it in 2004. So, um, you know, the Turkish people do not trust paper money. And uh, if we can talk about India for a moment, I first went out to India in 1965. In those days, the price of gold in rupees was uh, about 160 rupees an ounce. Today it is 90,000 rupees an ounce. So for the farmer, for the, the, um, the lower middle classes as it were, the people who just managed to put a little bit aside for the security of their families, for them gold is always the preferred investment medium. For that very, very reason, it's the only thing which has really uh, retained its purchasing power. What are your thoughts on the energy deal between China and Russia? And do you think that uh, energy products can be bought in the future in gold? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but the deal between Russia and China, I think, was being planned a long time ago. It, it is, after all, part of uh, the reason that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was set up. The problem with the Ukraine is that it's probably accelerated that and it has suited Russia in particular to send a signal to uh, Western Europe that, look, we don't need your business, we've got enough business selling our gas to someone else. So, you know, and, and that I think is, is a very, very important part of the geopolitical game, the chess game that's being played at the moment between Russia and Europe. Yeah. And what are your thoughts on the fact that the Russians are developing payment system outside of SWIFT? Doesn't surprise me. Um, I, I think all these countries uh, noted what happened to Iran. First of all, the Americans closed down their US dollar bank accounts. And then they lent on the SWIFT organization, which is based in Brussels, which deals with settlements in all the other currencies, so that SWIFT refused to accept any transactions which involved Iran. Now, if you're um, Russia or any country, uh, not, if you like, in the Western axis, wanting that degree of independence, this is a very, very worrying thing. It means that you cannot be independent internationally unless you make your own arrangements. And that, I think, is basically why Russia is looking at um, making itself really very, very independent, if you like, from the West financially. And I think in that sense, the, 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 the sanctions that the West is trying to impose on Russia um, is probably hurrying up a process which was happening anyway. And so do the Asians buy gold because they perceive gold as independent money? Yes, they do. They understand it. I mean, they don't necessarily have a high degree of sophistication in their analysis of gold. But the one thing they do know, Lars, is that gold retains its value. It cannot be printed by the government. It's the one thing which you can own and you can put to one side and it can be used as money in an emergency. Indeed, the Indian farmers do that all the time. When their crops fail, they go out and they borrow money for next year's seed, seed corn using gold as collateral. So gold is very much part of everybody's thinking in Asia, and that's something we mustn't ignore. One big story in the West related to gold is the German gold story. There is gold stored here at the Bank of England, more stored at the New York Fed. Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? I was absolutely amazed that the Fed didn't return more of the Bundesbank's gold. It is the Bundesbank's gold and they should have been prepared to ship 1,536 tons, which I think is more or less the total amount of Bundesbank gold, uh, um, which is held by the Fed, that should have been shipped back. As it was, they came out with an agreement to only ship 300 tonnes under some pretext that, uh, oh, well, this is all we can sort of do at the moment, and the Bundesbank saying, well, you know, we've got to make arranged storage arrangements and all the rest of it, so we'll do 300 tonnes at the moment. In the first year, if I, had been, um, if I had been the Fed, I think I would have come up with more than five tonnes. Um, it's laughable, only five tonnes. And that's sending a clear signal, and this is why we need proper information, because this may be wrong, but in the absence of proper information, it's sending a clear signal that that gold does not exist. And that, I think, is extremely important. It's a matter for the Bundesbank, and um, it's something which um, I think that the, the hard money cadre in the Bundesbank, who, thank goodness, is still there, to a degree anyway, um, they must be absolutely uh, livid about it, really angry about this. Um, and, but, you know, I think if I was the Bundesbank, I'd be in the market buying gold because I know it's not in New York. 
Uh, one of the reasons uh, why the Germans say they have the gold there still in New York and London is because they want to have some flexibility in the event of a currency crisis. Now, would be gold uh, the winner of a currency crisis? I, I think that's a nonsense argument. Because if you get a currency crisis, what do central banks do? Just produce swap lines. You know, yeah. It really doesn't matter. Yeah, so it really doesn't matter. So this makes no sense at all what they say. And they're saying it. It doesn't make any sense to me at all, yeah. no. But I did not make this up, they said this. Yeah, yeah. As a final question, I would like to ask you, Alistair, what are the three top reasons to invest in gold? The biggest reason is that an awful lot of money has been printed, particularly since the Lehman crisis, and gold is the only asset that has not gone up to reflect the falling purchasing power of paper currencies. It is therefore severely undervalued and overlooked. I think that's my biggest reason. There are subsidiary reasons. You mentioned the, gold, the, the, the German gold situation. That to me is indicative that the amount of gold actually held by Western central banks is considerably less than what they say in their accounts. And that is extremely important. And the third reason which is tied into that is the geopolitics of gold. China and Russia are trying to corner the gold market. And I think what we're about to see with the price of gold going up is the biggest transfer of wealth from west to east in all of human history. Those are my three reasons. Thank you very much. That's my pleasure, Lars. Yeah.